done with the uh, intelligence controversy and the various other theories for multiple intelligences, why they're not uh, valid. Uh, but nonetheless, you know them for the AP test if they show up. All right, uh, number page 19, the last one for this unit five is uh, intelligence tests. And I already told you a bit about intelligence tests. Uh, there's three factors you have to have as far as knowing if your test is a good test or not, if, if it's a valid, predictable, reliable test. All right, uh, and you've got to have three, these three factors are uh, SD standardized. This is actually like the last couple slides on it, but I'm going to first tell you how we assess if a test is good or not, and then I'm going to talk about the history of how we constructed these tests and where we're at now. So it's got to be standardized, it's got to be reliable, and it also has to be uh, uh, have <coughs> predictive validity. All right, so if I want to know I have a valid intelligence test, like it's a good one, it's a solid one I can use, it has to have these three factors. So here's what they are. Standardized means it's the same set of questions uh, for all takers. Why is that important? So if I'm, if I'm going to give you all an intelligence test, right, and we talked about earlier how I could take 10,000 questions uh, in, in a test bank about you know, math and language and all kinds of topics and spatial uh, features, whatever. And I could pull any set out of like you know, 200 questions or whatever. So I got my 10,000 question bank here on all topics. If I pull out 200 questions as a test, why is it important that you all have the same 200 questions if I'm trying to get your intelligence uh, for, for this room? Exactly. So if I give you all different 200 questions, uh, it's not as accurate as if they're all the same questions. So then if I have the exact same questions, I know exactly how to perform, co perform compared to everybody else. Because there is a random chance that if I give you all 200 different questions, that some of your questions are easier than others. Like let's say you get a test that has a bunch of easy questions randomly, and you get a test that has a bunch of hard questions. And uh, you would rank higher than her, even though that might not be the case, or maybe you're equal or whatever. But on the test, it would show differently. So they have to be the same questions. All right, so the SATs that you guys take, um, it's like this. There's a huge set of questions they pull from. But when you take the test on a given day, everyone's getting that exact same test, right? Certainly everybody on that same site as you is getting that exact same test. And this is why, by the way, they don't care if you do the SAT a bunch of times because you might get different questions each time, but every time you're being measured, you're being measured against uh, people who took the exact same test. And you're gonna have, like I said, you're gonna place uh, pretty much the same each time. There might be a little variance depending on like, oh, one day I did bad because I was really stressed out or I had something happen in my life that caused the stress or I missed a bunch of sleep or I was sick. On an individual day, that could make you perform a bit uh, worse. But, you know, if your uh, conditions and sleep and stress are relatively stable, whatever they're at for you personally, um, your, your testing is gonna be roughly the same no matter how many times you take it. If the questions are the same, like is the order the same? Or like they can, can no, they can, ran they can randomize the order. They can vary the order. Um, and I think they do just to try to prevent cheating as best they can. Um, they do like, when you do these tests, it's very serious obviously because it has, the implications are high. Uh, on you know your rank and how that could affect your acceptance and whatnot. So first of all, they'll spread you out uh, from uh, everyone. But yeah, um, I believe they also do put it in different orders, uh, or at least have like two test sets of the same questions in different orders, so that like every other person you can't just you know cheat by looking over at their what they bubbled in or whatever. But yeah, um, that's what standardized means. They, everyone has to have the same test, so that way I can accurately measure uh, your intelligence uh, relative to everybody else. Uh, we also mentioned too that generally speaking you want to be weighing your intelligence against other people your age right because it's not fair to if i have a high fluid intelligence and uh, at age 17 and so does a 33 year old and they both take a test on the same thing 33 year old is going to beat them just because if they have the same fluid intelligence and they're both about the same motivation he's had almost twice as much time to learn stuff in fact you could argue he has because uh, um, you know, your first three, four years of life, that doesn't do a whole lot of good as far as for an intelligence test. So he's had more conscious years uh, than, than double you, potentially, 
uh, to learn stuff, so that wouldn't be fair. It's much more accurate, at least the most accurate we can get is to measure you against people your age, because you've had roughly the same amount of time and opportunity uh, to learn things. Uh, obviously, there are factors that can uh, impede that. If you're in a working or poor class compared to a middle class, you've probably had a lot less educational opportunities, um, or, or at least quality, potentially. Uh, but again, that's the closest we can get to accurate as far as, as age goes. All right, that's standardized. It's gotta be standardized, it doesn't mean a whole lot, because you could've gotten easier tests, then the results would be totally skewed. Uh, it's also gotta be reliable, and here's what I mean by reliable. Um, and I've already said it a few times. I should be able to pull out any 200 questions so long as you all get the same one. Questions, questions, 200 questions. As long as, uh, like say I do it four different times with four different sets of questions, as long as you all take the tests and have the same questions, right, whether it's one time or four times, what should the results look like? They should be relatively the same, right? That's the reliability. So I should be able to take another test and give it to everybody and get the same results, roughly speaking, or I should even be able to do things like repeat the test and get about the same result. Like, so I give you the test, the next day with the exact same test, I should get roughly the same results uh, as far as your rank goes. Um, I should even be able to take half the test if I said, all right, let's throw out 100 questions of this test, just toss them, and only look at the other 100. Should my results be much different? If they were, would that be a problem? It might be, right? Why were, the, why were these 100 questions different than the other 100? They should be about the same results. So reliable means I should be able to get the same result uh, after multiple testing. So same result, or relatively same results. You never get exactly the same rank, uh, but you shouldn't be varying by you know, 30 percentile uh, points, right? It should be uh, much smaller. So same results uh, if retested on the same one, uh, new test, or even if they only analyzed half the questions of the test, you should have relatively similar ranking. All right, predictive validity. What do I mean by that? That one I've also detailed to you guys. Predictive validity, it's an aptitude test. So we're trying to measure our ability and future learning. So what would predictive validity It does as you narrow it, you're right, that's something I'll talk about, but in general, should I be able to give you a test in junior high and high school and have that roughly align with the results in college and after college? Yes. Yes, that would be predictive, right? If, I'm, if, I, if your results in junior high or high school are way different than your college uh, performance on a test or uh, on a standardized test, or uh, you know, when you're off in your career, then it's not very predictive, right? However, if I can use a test to uh, consistently predict your performance, your scores, uh, or your ranks uh, and grades in college, or your uh, performance in a, in a um, what's the word like for? career, then it has predictive validity, right? Then it's, it's valid in that I can give it to you now, and if I test you 20 years later, you're gonna rank about the same, or I should be able to look at your life of performance accomplishments in college or career, uh, and they should, they should align roughly with, uh, with how you uh, scored on these tests. That's predictability, but you're right. The further down I get in life, they do get slightly less accurate because the population is gonna narrow. So if I test the whole high school on an intelligence test, it's gonna place you uh, based on percentile, right, for the most part. So, you know, you're going to be weighed, on an IQ test it's supposed to be, you know, the entire population, but let's say I'm just giving you a, a rank for this school, right? Let's say you're like, you blow everybody out of the water, wow, great job, 99th percentile. That would mean, out of the 2,000 or so people, there's only what? How many would that actually be? What, like 20 people that are? Yeah, right? Yeah, only 20 people, roughly speaking, uh, might actually be as smart or smarter than you. That's kind of what that would mean, all right? Makes sense, all right? So if I do that again, you know, next year it should be relatively the same. However, if I rank you percentile-wise in college, do you think it might be a little different? Why? Now my IQ wouldn't because that's, again, all ages. But if I just look at my subset of college students, am I still going to be 99th percentile, like, for sure? No, because the population in college has changed. It does, right. So, uh, again, if I just took a basic IQ test with all people my age, it would be the same, roughly speaking. But if I narrow that down to just college goers, 
are college goers, do you think, generally more intelligent or less intelligent than the general population? More generally more intelligent, right? They had to qualify to get there. They want to go there. Uh, they're not going to succeed if they struggle uh, with an intellectual endeavor, so they're not going to be in the first place. So because I've narrowed my population to a smaller subset of smarter people, that's going to mean I might not get a 99th percentile. Now I might get 91st percentile. Does that mean I got dumber? No, what does it mean? It just means I took more of the people that scored well, and now I'm being weighed against them, all right? So if I keep going all the way down to the PhD level, generally speaking, PhDs are, are intelligent, motivated people. So if I took a, a percentile test with 100 PhDs, and I get a 20, 20th percentile, does that mean all of a sudden I, I just lost my intelligence overnight? No, what does that mean? Yeah, that's just my rank among highly motivated, intelligent people, right? Uh, so I could still be 99th percentile, I probably am. Uh, but uh, if I'm weighing myself against just that tiny subset of people, then it's gonna uh, um, be less accurate as far as predicting my, my percentile. So again, if I'm talking general population, it's extremely uh, uh, predictive. But if I decrease the population to these specific subsets of intelligent, motivated people, then my uh, scores are gonna vary if I just compare it to them. That's, that's what that meant in the notes. So that, I'm, what I'm trying to say is, not that you'll ever do this, but you know, you might do really well here, have a high class rank, et cetera, but then you go to uh, college, you graduate, and you go to graduate school, you get a master's degree. You might not be the number one student there because that's really just a collection of number one students. All right, so it's a, it's a much tougher, narrow, narrower population. But nonetheless, predictability, I should be able to accurately uh, forecast my ability and learning across time. And again, the intelligence tests we have now are very, very accurate. If I give them to you in junior high to high school, uh, they should accurately predict your uh, um, intelligence and or success in college uh, and career, and they do for the most part, right? That's why um, it's got the 0.6 correlation coefficient, which is much higher than any other one thing for analyzing my college and career success is, is intelligence. Make sense? All right, so that's how they form. One other thing too I want to mention, if I look at the basic population, my tests should, and they do this consistently, form what's called a bell curve. Anybody ever heard that term before? Yeah. All right, cool. I know that uh, Baldwin likes talking about that a lot. So um, a bell curve is basically this. So I'll, I'll use IQ just as the marker. For IQ, an average score, which means if I'm scoring the 50th percentile compared to people my age, my score will be 100. Right, that's the average score. Average Joe or average Jane is, is 100 IQ. Right, that means they're the 50th percentile for their age. Um, what you find is a lot more people clump together as far as their score on IQ tests near the middle. So almost like I think like 65% of people are within like a, a, a 10 IQ range of this 100. It's like 110 and 90. I think I might be wrong in the exact number, but I think like 65% or so people are right here in this rank because it goes like this and make kind of a bell. It's like a large bulge and then it tapers off uh, as you get to the extremes down to nothing, right? It does that in both directions. This isn't gonna be exactly equal because I can't do that, but it's my best attempt. That's kind of what a bell curve looks like. And they can be flatter uh, uh, than that, but that's kind of what it looks like. Uh, and then as I go down, of course, as I get to the extremes, uh, I have less and less people to the point that I, that I have none, right? If I've got an IQ of like 20 or 30, I, I can't do anything. Um, I, there's literally nothing I can do. In fact, even in the 60s, you probably aren't going to be able to speak. Uh, or if you are, it's going to be really, really simple and, 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 and telegraphic and um, um, take you a long time to do. Um, same thing as I go really high, too, by the way. Uh, as my problem solving gets better and better and better and I get smarter and smarter and smarter for IQ, it's, I have less and less people there. So uh, already by, by the time I think, I think the, at 135, that's the 98% of people are, are lower than 135. If your IQ is higher than 135, I think you're the top 2%. And I think 140, maybe it's 130's top 2%. I forget which one it is. See, the 130 or 135 is the top, is the top 2% if you're above that. And then past 140, it's, it's, the, it's the only the top 1% uh, as you go on. Uh, on all the way.
And uh, when you start getting into the 145, 150 range, up to about 160, that's when you're flirting with geniuses. And certainly beyond 150, 160 would be considered a genius. I think Einstein was like 160 something. Um, you know, you can have people that have incredibly high IQs. All right, that's what it kind of looks like. And again, depending on what I'm looking for, it, I can have a different shape, but that's basically what a bell curve is. Almost all people in the middle, and as I get to the extremes, I have less and less people, essentially. Um, so uh, that's what the average human population looks like. Uh, when we get to gender differences, I may as well just talk about it now because we're talking about intelligence. The average IQ for male and females is exactly the same. All right, so men and women, if you give them all a bunch of tests, get the average scores, they both at 100, there's no difference. The only difference between the two populations is the curves look a little different. Um, so, and again, before I go and talk about this, because again, this is an opinion of mine or anything, this is just how the data is laid out. Exactly the same averages, so you can never say men and women are smarter than the other, because they're not, they're the same. Uh, but the curve looks slightly different. So the female curve looks more like this. It's a, it's a large, tall hump, essentially, right, with a, with a 100 average. Males, uh, same exact average, but the curve looks a tiny bit different. So be, instead of being really high at the top, the male is a little flatter as far as the curve goes. So male uh, curve looks more like this. This isn't exactly it, but something like this. Oops, I'm trying to make this thing here. All right, so what's the difference there? Less males are average or something. <laughs> exactly, uh, I have less males scoring towards the average, all right? So what I'll have here is, uh, and this is maybe the stereotype, because like if you go through school, I know the stereotype has always been that, that girls end up doing better, and they usually do in school. Uh, and there's personality reasons for that, which we'll get into in, in, in uh, period seven. On average, though, again, I'm, I'm only talking <coughs> averages here, guys. I'm not talking about this means you are this. As an individual inside this group, you can be anywhere on the spectrum, all right? But if we look at a whole population average, there are personality fa factors that factor into women doing better in the schooling system, which we'll get to. They're generally higher in conscientiousness and more orderly, um, so that's obviously going to help you out in school. But uh, as far as intelligence goes, we have uh, more women clumped towards the center, uh, and then we have uh, more men spread out and less towards the center. So it doesn't really matter much if you're looking at it. The only place it matters is at the extremes. Why does it matter at the extremes of the, uh, of the curve? Anybody got anything? So same average, right? Males and females, exact same average if I take a bunch of tests. 100 both populations. But I have more females uh, clumped towards the center here and more males uh, or less males in the center and uh, clumped out towards the side. What what impact does that have do you think? What are the uh, ramifications of that? Let's think about this. How many females Compared to males, am I going to have on the really low intelligence side? I'm going to have less males? No, less females. Maybe I said it backwards. Yeah. So if I did say it backwards, you're right. So if I go to super low intelligence, I'm going to have less females. Why? I thought they had the same average. Is it because more females tend to score the average than females? Yeah, they do. So if I like zoom in, I know it's tiny, but if I zoomed in here, this uh, purple mark, which is representing males in this case, uh, it's slightly higher at this part than females. So what that means is, if I look at IQs of like 80, 70, 60 and below, I'm gonna have way more males down there, right? So I think at uh, the IQ mark of about 70, uh, males outnumber females like six to one or something like that. So if I'm talking to people that have intellectual disability, right, this, that used to be called mental retardation, but now it has you know that stigma to it, so it's intellectual disability. Um, People classified as having an intellectual disability, uh, there's like six times more men that are classified for intellectual disability, all right? But they have, they have the same average. Why there's six times more men uh, being uh, 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 labeled as intellectually disabled? I just gave you the answer. Why, 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 why? Same average, but I have way more males suffering from intellectual disability. Why is that? It's about the curves. You guys are getting this. Because more females are uh, richer. 
Yes, since more females are clumped towards the average, that means I'm gonna have a, a, a lot more males when, when I really get down to the end of this curve here, I'm all of a sudden gonna have very few females with uh, uh, scores that are very low, but, and I have way more males that have scores that are uh, very low. I, what I, what's important to point out is there's almost nobody at all down here, right? So the amount of people I have down here, period, whether it's male or females, is very, very low. But of those very low amounts, almost all of them are males right, because of this uh, slight difference in the curve. So again, how many people do I have uh, below 70 IQ? Very, very, very few, right, just a few percentage. And if I look at that small population, it's almost all guys because of the behavior of this curve. It's a little bit flatter. So that means uh, the average is gonna be the same, no difference, but when I get to the extremes, I'm gonna have way more. What about on this side? What? Yep, it's going to be the exact same thing. So I have five to six times more uh, males in the very, very low IQ bracket. But also, if I go to the extremes on the like ultra genius level, I'm going to have five or six times more men there as well. right? But what I don't want to, this is why, because I've heard this argument before uh, going both ways. All this means is, at the most extreme, you're going to have more men. And that means on the extreme of high intelligence and the extreme of low intelligence. But that doesn't mean men or women are smarter than each other at all. The averages are very much the same. And also, it doesn't mean that you know women aren't capable of getting here, because they are. Like There are still women here, uh, and they're all still, still women here. It's just that there's, they're outnumbered slightly because these curves are behave slightly differently. It's really weird how this works, because the, the difference here is just barely anything. In fact, the average is the same. But when you go to the extremes, there's a huge discrepancy. It's the same thing with uh, aggression. For males and females their their curves are almost exactly the same but if i go and look at prison populations who do i who do i see in there for violent crimes males. men by a large margin and it's like what men and women are up about the same aggressiveness like uh the odds that a male is more aggressive than any given female is like uh 60 so it's like it's almost half and half the aggression levels are about the same but all of a sudden my entire prison population for the most part is men as far as violence goes why would that be what? Testosterone. Well, who goes to prison, by the way? You're right, testosterone does have a bearing on it. Do, uh, do people near the average in aggression go to prison? No, who goes to prison? To people on the extremes that are really high in aggression, right? And because the, the male curve is moved over just a tiny bit, uh, that means that the average male and female, pretty much the same. But if I go to the extremes, the aggressive, physically violent men way outnumber the females uh, just because that curve is moved slightly over. Uh, that's that's essentially what that means. So when people talk about things about whether it's intellectual disability or uh, genius level Nobel Prize winning uh, accomplishments, those are these people. And the reason why there's a discrepancy in number of, of uh, intellectually disabled men or Nobel Prize winning men, a large part of that is because of this slight difference in the curve. Same with prisons. There's way more men in prisons for violent crimes because of that tiny little difference on the extreme uh, of the curve. Like if you flipped it somehow, all of a sudden we'd have a whole bunch of women in prison uh, and a bunch of men would not be because the extreme would be the other way. All right, uh, we'll talk about that with the personality. But that's what a bell curve is. If my results look like this for intelligence on a prop population, uh, I know that they're almost certainly accurate because that's how it plays out. You have very few extreme high performers and very few low performers with most people clumped here around the average. All right, that's a bell curve. Okay, so the fact that we even have this concept of like giving a test and attaching a score uh, to your intelligence, which again is something people debate because there is that fear that they're playing review games. They're probably playing that, that shooting game that uh, kind of like basketball, how we play. That's what they usually get excited about over there. But, anyways, I, don't, I lost track of what I was saying. Uh, oh, the fact that we uh, try to uh, get, provide a test that sort of gives you a number and a rank for your intelligence. Which again, can be problematic, right? Because you can label people uh, as being uh, low scoring, uh, low intelligence, or even potentially uh, ridiculing them for being uh, weirdly high scoring. Uh, that is a danger that was recognized by a lot of these guys that are gonna develop these tests. But uh, nonetheless, that process of trying to come up with a test to figure out and give you a numerical score and place you uh, was came up with uh, by a guy named, uh, I think he was Sir, he was knighted, Sir Francis Galton in the uh, late 19th century. I think it was in the 1890s, but don't quote me on the exact date. Um, he was, this is a little misguided, uh, 
he was on the quest to find the perfect human. He was all excited about social Darwinism and evolution, so he really wanted to make a super species of humans. So his quest was to find the people in the world that were super smart and super physically active and have them breed, essentially. So to do that, he tried to come up with a test to find people for that. He found nobody, by the way, that matched those, uh, those markers of like, I'm an insanely good athlete and I'm insanely intelligent and all these qualities. But uh, nonetheless, as misguided as his um, objectives were and his goals were, he did develop the idea or conceive of the idea of trying to analyze somebody's intelligence and rank and, and score them, right? And started the process of trying to figure out how to, what we needed to make them standardized, reliable, and predictive. So um, he's again looking for, uh, looking for uh, eugenic purposes. You guys know what eugenics is? What is that? I think I told you before. What is it? What's eugenics? It's not a good topic, by the way. Is it when like you want to you want to like enhance like the superior? Like, yes, you're trying to alter a, a a set of genes in a population. In this case, humans. So, it, what eugenics means? You want to identify good genes, and have those individuals with them uh, have kids, and you want to stop the ones who have bad genes from, uh, from having children, essentially, right? So you can see the implications here, ethically and morally, to doing this to humans. And this, of course, is gonna help lead to, um, you know, our mistaken quest for the eugenics movement in Germany and the United States and other countries where they try to sterilize uh, low IQ people or handicapped people or repeat criminals. Uh, and then, of course, you have the most extreme example, the Holocaust, where uh, Hitler and the Nazis were trying to er eradicate inferior genes and promote these Aryan genes. Uh, so, Hart was in the wrong place, that's for sure, but uh, he did at the very least uh, identify or conceive the idea, identify, accept the idea, idea of a standardized intelligence test as well as um, a numerical score attached to it. Alright, so that's his legacy regarding intelligence. He did a bunch of other stuff too. Um, a lot of these guys were, I don't say accidentally racist, but they ended up being racist because back then that was the prevailing theory. So they were kind of, I don't want to exonerate them and say they were fine people because those views are horrendous. But that you have to keep in mind, this is called historiography, you have to keep in mind what the ideas back then were. Uh, and this wasn't, this was a new idea. It was obviously wrong, and we've talked about why already, uh, why it was wrong specifically. Uh, but a lot of them, thought there was evidence for this idea. So it's not like they were out to destroy people necessarily, but certainly by our time, it, it, it's quite clear that these views are wrong and racist and incorrect. Um, so take it with a grain of salt when you see how racist these guys are. Uh, they're kind of victims of their culture at the time and the way they saw the world and what they thought were scientifically accurate predictions and information. Uh, nonetheless, though, nowadays, by today's standards, definitely uh, racist. This is very racist. Okay. Uh, next, though, is a guy who had actually some, some good ambitions. It was a guy named uh, Alfred Binet. This will be the last guy I talked about, by the way, before we, we close up. Alfred Binet, in the uh, 19, early 1900s, like 1900, 19, like the 1910s, basically, 1900s and 10s. He was uh, the French Minister of Education, and he had a very unique problem. He had to um, deal with the very first public school system, all right? So generally speaking, you guys have all learned the same stuff, right, at your age, by 11th grade, 12th grade. You all went through the same things. You learned your letters and your, and your spelling and your grammar and your, uh, you know, counting and adding and so on. You're all about having the same access to information, right, for the most part? Okay. This is different, though. This is early 20th century France. When I start my public school system, like you haven't gone all the way up through kindergarten, you don't know what education people have. I could come in at 16 and have never learned anything. Like I don't know how to read or write. Does it mean I'm stupid? No, uh, but I was just never taught anything. Or I could have some kid who was raised in the middle class and he's had a tutor his whole life. So he's 16 and he is insanely able. He knows math, he can read, write, all that stuff, right? So I have a huge variance on um, exactly what people know. 
So again, nowadays it's not that hard because you guys all came up with the same system, but pretend we had no public schools and all of a sudden we're like, all right, we're starting schools and you all came at age 17, you guys would be all over the place on what you know and don't know. So he uh, used this idea of trying to figure out people's intelligence to properly place them. He was very afraid that, uh, of course, people would be labeled as unintelligent. He talks about it frequently in his writings, understandably. Nonetheless, he had to know what your abilities were so he could place you in the right class, right? Because we can't just say, all right, all 17-year-olds go to 11th grade uh, or, or 12th grade. doesn't work because you guys know a bunch of different amounts of stuff. So he came up with what's called a mental age, which basically is uh, you find out the average performance for an age group. All right. So he would uh, test all of you 17-year-olds. He'd find out what the average score was. And then what he would do is he would take your individual score and see how you scored compared to other 17-year-olds. All right, so he would say, all right, you scored way below the average 17-year-old. In fact, you scored what an average 13-year-old would score. So where is he going to place you? With the 13-year-olds, right? Whatever grade that ends up being, right? So that's basically what it is. Your mental age is uh, uh, your performance for an age group um, weighed against that. Against average, right? So if you had the uh, ability of an average 10-year-old, but you're an 8-year-old, you're going to be moved up or down? up right with the uh, other 10 year olds. If you're uh, an 11 year old and you have the reading and abilities of an eight year old, you're not gonna be placed with the other 13 year olds, they're gonna place you with the eight year olds. And that's a proper approach, right? Cause I can't shove you in a class you have nothing, no ability to learn in. Uh, so he wanted to correctly place you. Uh, and he does develop this concept of a mental age, which we'll talk more about tomorrow. Back it up. Continuing from yesterday, we left off on Binet, the French, Education minister, he had a very unique task to handle, attempt. Uh, what was what was his task and why was it unique? Somebody remind me. Of course, the Morgan box. You first. Um, he had to like find a way to assess the white people's intelligence between like children and parents because there's different people that had, like of different ages that uh, had different like intelligence levels. So like some older people like had like a higher IQ than like Exactly. Why didn't they all, all have education? Um, because of like their background and um, their upbringing. So like some people in like um, rural parts didn't have like uh, education, while then other people were being educated. Yeah, uh, they had no public schooling system. So when they did start one, and all people, <clears throat> you know, minors had to come in and start the schooling, they had no idea where to place them. Like you mentioned, because some kids got an education if their family could afford it, or maybe they, you know had Sunday school lessons, which by the way back then was actual school on Sunday, uh, taught by middle class women mostly to working class kids, or they had nothing at all. So you can come in at age 16 and be relatively smart and read and write, or you can come in and uh, not know how to do either of those things. So they didn't know where to put them, and he does develop a way to do that. So uh, what, what concept or way does he sort of invent to uh, properly place these kids? Exactly. Uh, he's the, the ones who one who developed the idea of a, a mental age. All right. So again, uh, they just take everyone in your age, they test them, and they see about what the average score is, and then they're going to rank you based on that. So if I do better than the average 16-year-old, I'm 16. Great. I'm going to be placed at a higher uh, age or grade level. If I do worse, then I'll be placed at a lower, greater age level. Doesn't mean that they're, you know capability or capacity for intelligence is lower. It just means that they weren't given the opportunity to learn anything. All right. As time goes on, as uh, states get wealthier and more stable, uh, in the West particularly, um, so they have the stability and safety of people who don't have to worry about, you know, dying of, uh, you know, basic things like uh, criminals and other states invading or famine disease as the 20th century goes on, uh, as well as having a, a more complex and more refined uh, education system, what they're gonna find is people keep getting smarter, like the whole population, by the way. So for example, if you guys were all to go take a test in 1904 compared to the other 16 and 17 year olds, how do you think you would do? Just 
just a little better? A You'd smoke them, right. So uh, what they're gonna find out pretty quickly is every year they have to change the mental age, met mental age metrics because as time goes on, as your country gets more stable, your education system gets more refined and consistent, and as those kids are growing up with nutrition education the whole way, uh, the intelligence keeps going up. It has kind of flatlined a little bit in a lot of Western countries, but any country that started a little late, like countries in Asia or Africa or, or South America or other parts of Europe that weren't uh, caught up uh, in the East and the South, they do experience this climb. That, by the way, is called the Flynn effect, where when you start an education system and your state gets more stabilized, so you're not having civil war or, or, or uh, foreign wars, uh, there's not the threat of you know rebellion, things like that. I generally have an area that it's lawful and uh, crime is reduced, which we've seen across time, especially the 20th century. Uh, you have, again, what's called the Flynn effect, <clears throat> which they noted pretty quickly. And again, it's the idea that uh, populations tend to have their IQs or intelligence grow uh, as you get more stable, more access to nutrition, more access to education, all right? And now we got the internet too. So it, it's the amount of information you have uh, and safety and consistency you have and access to nutrition you have here in the United States, it is just phenomenally, exponentially higher than it was 100 years ago. So you guys would smoke 16 and 17 year olds uh, taking intelligence tests uh, 100 years ago. Uh, you would absolutely destroy them. So they have to like move the marker every single year. So the average score for a 17 year old now would be way too advanced for the average score uh, for, for an average 17 year old in 1904. Uh, so just understand that. And again, that's the Flynn effect. The idea that uh, over time, so like you start from 1900, let's say the United States, <clears throat> and their scores uh, on, on, on tests, 100 being average and you know 60 being uh, well below and 140 being well above, uh, over time, uh, if you adjust it for like, I don't know, a 2000 level, 2000 level IQ test, like the average um, 17 year old in 2000, uh, you would see that the IQs have been climbing steadily across time. That's called the Flynn effect. You see that in every single country that starts adopting those policies of education uh, when they become more stable and have access to nutrition, all right? But again, like I mentioned before, there is a bit of a flat line. Eventually you kind of reach the perfect cap of you're as stable as you can realistically be. You have access to nutrition and, and, and health uh, um, uh, information as well as the education systems and internet. Like there's, there's only so much capacity humans have. So we're kind of reaching that in some Western states already. Uh, and I believe China, Japan, and South Korea also have kind of started to flat line a bit. All right, so that's the Flynn effect. I don't know what part of the notes that was on, but I know it's in there. Uh, so that's all that is. So again, the idea, when you start stabilizing and educating your uh, um, population, uh, it's going to, of course, increase intelligence per generation, at least relative to their age. Okay, next guy then is uh, Luis Terman. I think his first name's Luis. I know it's Terman's last name. Mm -hmm. Yep, Luis Terman. Right. Uh, this is another dubious guy, just like Galton. Um, he is, of course, going to be misinformed about the data. Uh, but he is an important figure in advancing uh, standardized testing. So he does play off of Spearman's idea about a general intelligence, uh, and he does use the same factors that Spearman identified. But he's going to refine uh, Binet's test. Uh, and it's not like he steals his test idea. He uh, acknowledges Binet's uh, comp con contribution. Uh, and he was a professor at Stanford University, right over the hills there. And he developed what's called the Stanford uh, Binet uh, Intelligence Quotient Test. Yep, which is the modern IQ test, or at least the, uh, the, the what's the word I'm looking for? Proto form of it. All right, so he again takes this idea of mental age, which is a brilliant idea, right? Comparing how you perform to other people your age, because again, that's our best factor for making it relatively even as far as exposure to things. You could probably break it down by social class too, because people that are higher uh, in social classes have, are more likely to go to college and get educations than people that are lower in the working class, especially in the early 20th century. Uh, but age is probably the, about the best average figure we could possibly hope for. Uh, so he does take that idea and he refines it a little bit. Uh, he emphasizes a little bit more the uh, findings of uh, Spearman and the uh, general intelligence factors. 
and he develops a test uh, with the equation that is the basis for the modern IQ test. So an IQ test isn't necessarily exactly like a percentile rating, but the rating you do get shows how far ahead of or behind uh, your average age you are. So again, the middle is, is what for this test, the score? What's the average score? It's 100, right? And here's how you get it. So you take uh, Binet's idea of a mental age, so basically how you perform compared to the average person your age, right? So if I was eight years old, but I was performing at the level of an average 10 year old, what would my, my mental age be? Be 10, you'll have to think about that, yeah. So you're eight years old, you're testing it about the ability of a 10 year old, your mental age is 10. Does that make sense? All right, that doesn't mean your physical age is. So you take the mental age and you divide it by your actual age. So with the example I just gave, what's the actual age? Eight, right. So again, I take my tests, I perform at the age of a, 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 an average 10 year old. So my mental age would be 10 divided by eight, which is my actual age. All right, if you do that, you end up with 1.25. Is that an IQ score? No. no. So the one thing you would add to this, and by the way, they've changed the formula a bit now, but this is the basis for what it, this is what it's based upon. Uh, you would take that, multiply it by 100, and get 125 IQ, intelligence quotient score. So what does that mean? Above average, but considerably above average, yeah. Um, I wanna say that's the top like 15% or so uh, of people, uh, obviously, because that means you're you know, two years ahead at age eight, that's quite a bit. Um, it does get a bit more difficult to do that as you age, because you know, people are, um, I mean, like, let's say, for example, you're a four-year-old, but then you read at a sixth grade level, like, you're going to be way high. It's going to be like a 133 IQ. Um, that might come down a little bit as the years go by and people catch up developmentally. But by the time you reach adulthood, certainly high school and adulthood, uh, it's, it's pretty constant. Um, so that's why they usually look more closely at your junior high and high school uh, scores, because you've engaged into adolescence most likely through puberty, and, and you're engaging what your actual brain is going to be like. Uh, abstract thought wise uh, and uh, that's going to be the marker so that's essentially how they find these IQs all right uh, there was a lot of and is a lot of criticism for this test number one uh, it is all based on written uh, formats so if I can't read or write am I gonna do well on this test no uh, and I might actually be very intelligent because you can actually and I think I've told you guys this we learn language naturally, you know that, right? It's almost like you grow it, like it's already there and you're trying to kind of grow your ability. It's not like you sit there and learn flashcards. You just absorb it without even trying, right? You can see it in infants. Okay, does that happen with reading and writing? No. no. So language is a natural process for us, correct? Like our Broca, Wernicke areas and other areas are just looking for the language and looking to express it. Um, is writing a natural phenomenon? Okay, that hasn't been around, right? Language has been around as far as we know, human homo sapiens have been, right? It's a natural part of our brain. Writing's only been around for about how long? Three, four thousand years tops. It's really, really new as far as evolution. In fact, it's a cultural innovation. It's not even a, a, a standard natural human um, ability, right? It's a cultural phenomena invented in a few different um, uh, areas. Uh, mostly, most of the early forms came in the, the Middle East and Egypt. Uh, during the you know river valley civilization eras near the near the bronze age uh, there's some old ap world for you but uh yeah those are actually cultural innovations that caught on because they were so effective like i can now communicate with people far away long distances uh or even across time uh, by logging things in stone or on paper obviously the paper is more perishable but uh, they would etch things into stone and keep records that way because you can forget things but if you etch it down you're not going to forget unless you forget where you put the thing you etched it on or what the symbols mean that you etched it with. Um, so reading and writing is actually very difficult. It takes a long time to learn. Like you can learn to speak and, uh, and, and listen way quicker than you can learn to read and write. Um, and that's, that's why. It's actually a cultural innovation that's uh, spread because it's so useful. All right, uh, so one of the criticisms was it's uh, in written format, at least originally, only. So again, who's at a disadvantage here? 
Yeah, people that haven't been taught uh, to read or write. And this is about the, oh, we see in the 19 teens and 20s, I think. I always forget the exact years. Yeah, 1916. So this is the 19 uh, teens and tens and 20s. Uh, a lot of people weren't raised in a public schooling uh, system, so they didn't uh, have those abilities. So could I be somebody who's actually quite good at math and knows a lot about the world and can figure things out, but they do bad on this written test? Yes. yes. So that was one of the criticisms of it. Not as much of a problem now because we have way over 99% literacy uh, in all the developed countries, um, including uh, women increasingly. Obviously, if it's 99%, uh, women are included there too. But back then, I had very few men and almost no women that could read or write, so it was not a very good way of checking. Uh, another criticism, and this is a valid criticism, is who do you think in the world would score better if I gave these tests out to people from uh, uh, Western countries uh, as opposed to uh, Asian countries or Oceania countries or Eastern, Eastern and Southern Europe or Africa or Latin America. Who's going to be scoring the best here? The West. The West, right? Because they're genetically superior? <clears throat> no, right? That's what they thought. <clears throat> Why uh, were they scoring better in the early 1900s, in the early 20th century? Oh, that, that could be. I would certainly accept that as a historical explanation, right? The Enlightenment and all that's very individual focused, but I would want to be more specific than that. But you're definitely not wrong, uh, and I'll, I'll give you credit for that, uh, at least. The fact that we even developed these systems is more so based on our, our preference for individual accomplishment and ability. <clears throat> uh, institutions, institutions like colleges and universities? Yeah, because the West was more economically advanced thanks to a lot of their individualistic philosophical um, innovations that they randomly thought of, uh, like, you know, enlightenment ideals and things like that. Uh, yeah, they now have economic, they, they have a lot more wealth in these countries. <clears throat> they have economic and educational institutions because they have stable uh, domestic states. So the reason why the US and Western and Northern Europe scored so much better than everybody in the 1910s and 20s is because they already had a lot of those education systems in place. They had better nutrition. Their governments were more stable, so they had more time to like, you know, go about learning things instead of trying not to die uh, every week, essentially. So it wasn't really a fair marker then, <clears throat> and it was read incorrectly. So because, and again, this is one of the major criticisms, because uh, Western and Northern Europeans tended to score <clears throat> much higher, a lot of people felt like that's because they were genetically superior, right? Because we got Darwinism and social Darwinism is a pretty new idea, so people are looking for justifications as to why they're superior. And they take this as a, as a good marker of that. We know it's not a good marker because the environment was still a major factor here. If, you're not, if you don't have access to a stable government and nutrition and education, you're going to be, of course, behind people. Uh, so this, unfortunately, uh, turned into a... Uh, a racist set of racist policies, at least here in the United States, where they actually limited uh, immigration to the entire world except for uh, this region. All right, what do you think the basis of that decision was uh, was um, was uh, established on? Yeah, a lot of it was based on these IQ tests. Yeah. Uh, so there's a an act. If you're an A push, maybe you haven't gotten here yet, but you will. There was an act called the National Origins Act. Did you get there yet? Yes, sir. All right. Act. Uh, it got a formula which basically set the clock back to 1890. This is really specific. You know all this. I'm just giving it to you, the information. Um, it set the clock back to 1890, uh, a year when there was a whole bunch of foreign born Western and Northern Europeans. And it based immigration limits on that number. So uh, because there were so many foreign born uh, people from these regions then, they said, okay, only 2% of that population from 1890 are allowed in every year. Uh, so, as a result, immigration to regions in Southern Europe, Eastern Europe, Africa, Asia, uh, Latin America, not as much Latin America, but certainly the other continents, was very, 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 very low. And in fact, in some places they cut it outright, like you had the Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, I'm not sure exactly when they banned Japanese um, uh, immigration, but that's going to be around that time period. Uh, so yeah, we have a lot of immigration restrictions based on the results from these IQ tests. Um, so does that mean that all IQ tests are racist and should be thrown out? No. No. Back then, they definitely interpret them incorrectly. Uh, but this is cross-cultural. So again, once we once we control for 
your economic stability and political stability and nutrition and education, it, it evens out, right? There's very few exceptions to that. Uh, the only real notable exception is that Ashkenazi uh, Jewish population, which happens to score about eight to 15 points higher on average. Um, but they think there's a, uh, they think there is a uh, negative to that too, because I, I just saw a thing uh, from Steven Pinker, because he's one of those uh, Ashkenazi Jew heritage uh, people. And uh, apparently they have a gene, I don't know the name of the gene, but they have a gene that if you have one of them, it seems to greatly increase your IQ. Uh, and it's common in Jewish um, Ashkenazi Jews. But if you have two of them, like your mom and your dad gave you that gene, uh, it results in uh, a few de uh, debilitating genetic diseases. So it's, there's kind of a, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, when you exchange something and you uh, accept some damages for it. It's just totally escaping me right now, the word. There's a trade-off, there we go. Where there's a trade-off uh, uh, for, for that gene. But other than that, there doesn't seem to be any one population that is out above the rest. Uh, if you have those factors controlled for, human beings, groups score very, very, very similarly. You know, did you have a question? I thought you raised your hand, maybe you didn't. Um, but yeah, so that's that, uh, and of course, that also means, that, that also can be uh, attached to several old racist policies like the Nazis. Uh, because that group in Europe particularly was a bit smarter, uh, that meant they had a, a lot more people at the very extreme end. Did I tell you this yesterday or did I talk to my world class, AP Euro class about this? I told my AP Euro class about this, huh? <laughs> Not you guys. Oh, we talked about gender differences, huh? Yeah, yeah. Okay, it's a similar phenomenon though. So like here, for example, if I take the average person, right, at 100, <clears throat> so there's 100, here's the genius-ish marker, about the 140s, 150s, 65s, the, uh, uh, definitely the intellectual disability. So here's the average human population, all, all humans. But if I take uh, the Ashkenazi Jew uh, population, so there's 110 and there's 90, uh, it's a little bit over here to the right. I'm actually off by a little bit, hold on. So the proportion's not on point, but let's say that's what it's at, or let's say 110. Um, so there's not much difference that I'm going to notice here, but what happens over here at the extremes? Yeah, if I go way down to the end, past the genius level, I'm going to have like five, six times more geniuses in that, uh, at least proportionally, in that Ashkenazi Jew population. So uh, when the West starts adding in a lot of free market policies and practices, and, and people aren't limited by their social class, uh, or their race, and people just can kind of go out and are based much more on their ability, their own merit. Uh, what they found was these Jewish populations did really well. Uh, they, since they were uh, a bit smarter as a population, they would occupy uh, positions that required a great amount of intelligence, like the high banking positions, lawyers, doctors, things like that, high paying jobs. Uh, and they thought that it was like some Jewish conspiracy. Well, and that wasn't it at all. It was just because this population uh, had a, a slightly higher um, IQ based on a couple mutations, and that resulted in them disproportionately doing well. So some people in Europe, in France, in Germany, or well, across all of Europe really, uh, kind of took it out on the Jewish population there. And we saw, of course, the most horrible example of that with the uh, Holocaust. But yeah, there's no Jewish conspiracy, guys. Um, not that anybody believes that crap anyway, but uh, they just happen to do a little better um, because they think of that the genetic mutation. Anyways, the National or Origins Act was definitely a racist impl implementation uh, of immigration restriction, uh, wanting to only bring in, for the most part, uh, Western and Northern Europeans and exclude the rest. Uh, but again, we found out that that is not true uh, by race. Any questions about uh, Terman and the Stanford Binet IQ test? Good. I'm glad you guys know the history of it too, because otherwise people be like, "Oh, well, IQ is racist," and then they'll they might cite that, and you're like, "Uh, yeah, 100 and you know, 100 plus years ago it was, but now we know a lot more about it, so that is definitely incorrect." And we amended this, by the way. We changed this in 1965. We got rid of it because it's we realized how racist and stupid it was. All right, <clears throat> and wrong too, by the way. All right. Uh, next, I think we only have two more, right? It's Thurston and then Wexler, and that's pretty much it? Yeah, okay, cool. So, uh, this guy really uh, made a lot of strides in refining uh, intelligence tests, and, and his name is uh, Louis, I think his is Louise though, not Louis. I always screw up the first two names of these guys, yeah, Louis. Uh, Leon Thurston, 
Thurstone. Uh, this is the 1930s. I think he published his main work in 38, if I'm not mistaken, just before World War II began. So I'm sure that got looked over because of World War II, but he developed a uh, more refined factor analysis. So his mission was uh, to disprove, disprove, who was the guy that found general intelligence for the most part? In, Spearman. Yeah, Spearman. He was, his mission was to disprove uh, Spearman. Unfortunately, he does not do that. He actually largely confirms that the vast majority of people kind of have uh, an overall general intelligence trait or don't with some small exceptions. Uh, but nonetheless, he does improve the uh, measures, the factors, expands them a bit and makes some more specific. So we have kind of seven factors of intelligence here, by the way. And what you'll find is, uh, for the most part, all people and genders uh, are right on point. Uh, there's only a little bit of a difference uh, on average for men and women, but for the most part, they're pretty much the same across the board. So uh, the seven categories, if I can help you remember all, all off the top of my head, are uh, uh, word fluency, uh, verbal fluency or comprehension. So again, word fluency is just my use my ability to express language, and the comprehension is my ability to um, understand it, obviously. Uh, listen or read, perhaps. Uh, I've also got numerical ability. I've got spatial intelligence. I'll talk about what all these are here in a second. Actually, I'll just do them as I go over. Numerical, clearly mathematics, obviously. Just adding, subtracting, dividing numbers, etc. in your head for the most part. Uh, most IQ stuff is based on stuff you can do in your head, although they do allow you to use paper. That does technically slow you down. So if you can do something in your head, it's gonna be quicker than thinking about it, writing it, uh, and you'll do a little bit better on the test than somebody who can do it in their head accurately. Uh, spatial intelligence, I think I've talked about what this was. What's this one? So we're what spatial intelligence is. Isn't it like when you can see depths and shapes inside of your head? Yes, so you can, uh, yeah, rotate shapes and things like that inside your head. Uh, you can also uh, gauge proportionality very well. Um, you can orient yourself in the world by location very well. Like people who get spatial intelligence can usually tell which way northwest, east, south is. They can read maps very easily. Uh, they can make maps well. Whereas people without a good, a good score in spatial intelligence, they can't do any of those things well. Or they can't do them at all. Like some people can't rotate shapes in their head at all. Uh, so that's spatial intelligence. Uh, we also have um, inductive reasoning. That's your ability to uh, use logical analyses as well as find patterns uh, in the world uh, and in, in sets of data. You have also got memory. And don't tell me, I wanna remember what it is, but I'm just kind of stumbling right now. Oh yeah, processing speed or perceptual speed. Uh, that's basically how quickly you can take in information and utilize it and process it. All right, um, so yeah. Those are like the seven-ish measures. And he, un even though he was hoping to disprove Spearman's theory, he largely found people who scored uh, highly in one of these, scored highly in all the others, or if they scored average or below, they, these scores were relatively similar across the board. Uh, that, that's true for genders too, by the way. The only slight difference is women seem to be slightly better, and only a little bit and on average in the uh, uh, language portions and men seem to be slightly better. Uh, oh, I think women are a little bit better, better than memory too. Uh, and men seem to be slightly, slightly, slightly better in the uh, spatial and inductive reasoning. I think numerical, don't quote me on that one though. It doesn't really matter though because the differences are so slight. But again, in the case of all of these, if you have an average you know, bell curve and you even move it over a tiny bit, that makes a big difference on the extremes. So uh, you, you, you end up seeing that, uh, whether it's regarding literary works or whether it's regarding you know high level mathematics, um, you guys ever heard the term dumbbells and nobels? No. They uh, use that term for uh, for the for the male bell curve because uh, we talked about it yesterday. You know the, the female ones, the average for both is a hundred, but the female ones a little bit more like tightly clustered around the hundred uh, around the average, and the men's <laughs> is more flat across. The dumbbell and nobel phenomena is the fact that, um, and this is perhaps kind of mean, but this is what this term means. Uh, the dumbbells are the ones that are like, uh, because males outnumber females so much more, like five to six times in the intellectual disability uh, bracket below like 70 IQ. Uh, and then the Nobel is the, uh, um, the, the, the geniuses that are winning all of the Nobel prizes or being nominated for it, uh, for their 
you know, utilizing their intelligence to obviously figure out things no one's figured out before uh, that changed the world. So those are the seven factors. And again, he does set out to uh, disprove uh, um, uh, Spearman, but he does uh, end up sort of uh, pretty much confirming it. And again, this is pretty much a consensus. We've studied, been studying this for over 120 years. Um, there see, seems to be, for the most part, a general factor of intelligence, uh, but there are some minor exceptions, and Gardner did a, did a decent job of pointing some of them out. Any questions about Thurstone? All right. <clears throat> One of the problems, again, was the fact that most of these tests were uh, in the written format. So let's say I, I am uh, uh, higher scoring in some of these categories, but my word fluency or verbal comprehension is not the best, or I'm somebody who was not raised in a scenario where I was, I was taught to read and write, which is still possible now, although pretty rare. Um, they can't really showcase their intellectual ability even though they might have a very high intellectual ability. So in the 1950s, we had a guy whose first, his first name is David, I think, but his last name is Wexler, I know that for sure. Is it David? First yeah. Name? yeah, David Wexler. He developed a more abstract test, uh, I think it was 1954. 1950s and 60s is when it got popularized. He formed a more abstract uh, test, all right? And that's kind of the uh, focus nowadays, is tests that are able to show, uh, and again, we, we, for the most part, still firmly hold these seven factors uh, of intelligence when we're, we're trying to measure them. Um, but we want more ways of just, beyond just reading and writing, uh, to figure out and analyze what your intelligence might be. Right, because there are those rare occurrences when somebody has a really high score in one and low scores in the others, and it's uh, you really want to find out what they have. Uh, like, what if somebody had really low, uh, really low verbal, but they all the other ones were high? It'd be really hard hard to figure that out if they can't read and write well on the test. So they're looking for abstract test formats nowadays. So this is a contemporary um, focus, and what I mean by abstract is not just written format. I can do other things like. Uh, if I'm trying to analyze your inductive reasoning and processing speed, I could give you a puzzle and be like, all right, solve the puzzle, right? And that, that would require you to look at this thing, uh, figure out the best way to go about it, find the pattern and, and replicate the puzzle. Or, hey, make this shape, make a, an octagon out of these blocks. And you'd have to take a bunch of blocks and you'd, you'd try to make an octagon out of it. All right, so those are much more abstract ways of, of, of showcasing uh, some of these intellectual um, abilities and factors. So uh, forms like, uh, what did I just say? Puzzles and blocks, block formation. Um, they feature verbal language in these tests too. So the ability of you to understand somebody who's talking to you and then express yourself or answer um, verbally in response. So like, you know, what does this word mean? And then you have to think of it and then say it instead of just writing it. Um, and of course, some people are better at the verbal part than the written part and vice versa. Like, I know I do better. I'm certainly more articulate and specific if I'm, if I'm writing as opposed to if I'm speaking. Um, but for the most part, uh, you're going to be pretty close in both categories, assuming you were taught to uh, uh, read and write as well. Uh, but yeah, so you're gonna have verbal listening and responding practices. Um, there's another example too that I'm trying to think of. Oh, memory tests. So like they'll give you like little lists or little pictures or whatever. You have to like recreate the picture or describe the picture uh, or you know remember the list. So those are all tests of memory in a in, a, in an abstract format. So like you said, uh, list slash picture memory. So you do have to like list them or recreate it or describe it. And um, uh, they're a bit harder to measure, but uh, we have obviously been doing this for decades, so they have a pretty accurate set of measures now. Um, and a lot of these skills are being looked for, which are pretty much just the same factors. Some of them are reworded, but it's pretty much the same seven factors. Uh, these are the ways we go about it. And what we use uh, for the most part now is the Wexler's Adult Intelligence Scale test uh, and that's kind of the standard we do still have of course those um, uh, standard like SAT and um, uh, IQ tests that you could take you know digitally or via paper 
Those are the most common, obviously, because it's much easier. If I, if, I'm gonna, if I wanna test all of your uh, IQs for college, which is highly dependent on reading and writing anyway, uh, it's much easier for me to give a mass reading and writing test to a thousand people than having one person go and test uh, all of those people or, or having a hundred people go out. That's, that's a lot of work. It's much easier if I can just give you all a test, run them to the scanner and have a few people grade the written questions. Uh, so that's why they tend to use it, but you can definitely go the route of if you're just trying to figure out your intelligence or use it more abstractly, uh, use the uh, Wexler's test. So there still is definitely both, but that's the difference between the two. Um, this is more common for kids, obviously, because some of them haven't developed their reading and writing skills as much as they would want to. Um, so that's, this test is, uh, is a good way of, of figuring that out. Because you can give four-year-olds a block and say, a bunch of blocks that make a square, uh, and then you can really analyze how well they can, you know, you know uh, mentally put things together and how quickly they can do that and how quickly they can rationalize the best way to do it. Uh, it's a good way to do it, even though they have, they don't have the vocabulary to describe or understand things, you know, at age four or five. So that's kind of where we are now. And I think I mentioned it before, but I do want to review. If I want to test my future ability, right? My future ability to learn, my capacity to learn, my fluid intelligence, what sort of test would I use for that? Aptitude, right. Uh, you're going to look for an aptitude test. So that's my uh, uh, potentially current or uh, future learning capability. Future, and I'll put current and future. Current slash future learning. Uh, what about all the stuff that I've like learned as far as factual knowledge and maybe word comprehension or whatever at this point in my life? What kind of a test would I use for that to, to look for my crystallized intelligence? Not IQ test, yeah, achievement test. That's correct. So I'm looking for my crystallized intelligence. This isn't my speed at which I can understand things or my ability to figure things out. This is just how much I already know uh, about the world, statements of facts and things like that. Uh, I would use an achievement test. All right, and I already covered standardized tests and the uh, reliability. Right, having the same results on half the test or a new <coughs> test, the same test, as well as the predictability. So how well does it predict my performance in college and career from junior high or high school? Uh, and our tests are very, very, very refined at this point, and we're looking specifically for that. Um, but do know going forward, do you remember the stuff we talked about before too about intelligence, that it is arbitrary as far as how we've defined it, but that is how we've defined it. Uh, your ability to you know, analyze these patterns, rationally deduce that, and then make predictions. Uh, and that is a very, very, very good predictor of your success in college and career. Whereas you know, talents like dance and music ability, athletic ability, while wonderful and can be used to your advantage, absolutely, they're not, they're not predictors at all of your success in college or career. Um, yep, and the emotional one, if you factor for personality, the results completely disappear, so. Thank you.